there, there is a thing that I uh, have in my mind listening to, to what you just say. Uh, I love the Ericsson idea about uh, resistance. You know, uh, Ericsson says something like, um, there is no resistance. Resistance is um, a way of collaborate, um, uh, a way in which the client is saying to you that this is or this isn't the way it can collaborate with you. Um, so, uh, how can, um, how do you work with resistance clients in the Ericksonian way? How, how, how do you work with people that um, don't want to be here or are very suspicious or are saying in their personal way that being in therapy it's uh, difficult for them, that trusting you is difficult? Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you know, I had a I had a vet explain this to me, and I felt very stupid when she was explaining this to me. But uh, I had uh, I'd had a dog, uh, cared very much for this dog, and she was very well behaved. And I never had her on a leash or anything. She would you could literally just talk to her as if you're talking to another human being, and she would she somehow knew. You know, we go to a vet and I tell her, go over there and stand on the scales. And the dog would just go walk and stand on the scales. And I, it, 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 it was pretty impressive how responsive she was. And then uh, one day I've been telling her she needed to go outside and I was reaching to pet her or something. And then she growled and bit at my hand. It didn't actually, didn't, didn't harm me, but she snapped at my hand. And this really upset me. I was like, why is this dog, you know, disobeying me? That's the way I took it. I got very angry and upset with her. And then I was telling the vet about it when we went back to see the vet uh, that she had snapped at me. I didn't understand this. And she was like, well, she's getting, she's having a pain in her back from where uh, someone had uh, injured her. And she was like, uh, uh, she was just trying to tell you that even though you thought you were just petting her, you were hurting her. And she was trying to tell you that hurts, please yeah. stop. And then I felt all bad because I got mad at her. It's like, you know, cinnamon, never snap at me. You know? <laughs> As I was being mad at her, the poor thing was, was hurt and she was just trying to let me know, but with the only way she could. Uh, and it's the same with clients. Sometimes when you tell a client, you know, uh, here's what you're going to do or tell me this or, and then they say yes and they, they're, they, it's, they say they're going to do what you want, but then they're really not doing what you want uh, or they respond poorly to you without being able to have the intellectual awareness or the introspective awareness or the language to tell you, ouch, this hurts, you're, you're scaring me, or this is painful for me, or this makes me feel too controlled or whatever, they, they make a response that's, that can seem like a rejection or defiance or something that we don't like. Hmm. And so that uh, misunderstanding can be cleared up if you're thinking to yourself, what are they trying to, what are they struggling with? What is hard for them? What are they unable to do here? Or what are they fearful of? Mm. And uh, you keep trying to pursue that line of questioning, uh, not in an insulting way, it's more kind of a private dialogue, but you're, you're, you're asking more questions about, well, could you do this? Or have you tried this? Or how does it feel if I'm saying this? Or what just went through your mind? Or and then you'll find out what the person's, there's always something there that they're struggling mm. with. Uh, and they just couldn't tell you what they were struggling with. Once that's addressed, there is no more problem with resistance. And typically, if, if we want to ask what goes wrong most often in therapy, uh, I've done a little bit of research on this uh, just by collecting data at the end of the session on what clients kind of struggle with most. Uh, looking at all these different possible things. And the one that comes up most often for most clients is uh, the, the therapist expects me to do more than I'm capable of doing. Oh. Lots of people develop that feeling that you're going to try to, you know, that they're going to fail because you think they can do this much and they only feel they can do this much. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're not going to want to have to come back and tell you that they failed or they didn't do it or they did it wrong or so we're very sensitive about that. Again, it seems to me that it's, um, again, observing and listening uh, 
uh, Michael Lloyd, uh, I know you know it, uh, love to say insistence produce resistance. So it's uh, like, don't do that. If that way is not good for your client, choose another way. Ask to the client what is the best way for him. Um, another fascinating thing I'll do sometimes because I, I like to give people things that they can be working on, they can be doing in between sessions. And so I'll describe something and clients like that. They, they, want, they want to be trying to make things better and know what they should do. And so I'll give them something to work on and uh, some skill to develop or try. And I'll say, does that sound good to you? And they're saying, yes. And I'll, I'll ask them first as a yes or no question. Do you think that you'll do this? And then they say, yes. And then, then I switch from a yes or no question, which is all or nothing thinking to a more of a scale by using percentages. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, what is the percentage of possibility from zero to a hundred that you're going to do this thing that I'm giving you. In other words, 0% means there's no way in the world you're going to do it. A hundred percent means I could bet a million dollars on it, that you're going to do this. Where are you at? And they're like, about 34%, <laughs> or, you know, 30%. And at 30%, I'd say, do you realize that means there's a 70% <laughs> thing that I just gave you? And they're like, yeah, I think that's about right. I said, okay, well, let's see if we can change the, the nature of the, the exercise so that we can at least get it up to 50-50 because then we've at least got it as good as random chance that you'll follow through and do this. <laughs> then I can start asking some questions. What would get it from, you know, 30 up to 35 or up to 40? Like, how can we change this? And then you start getting the person invested in telling you, well, I need it to be this thing, or I, I, I don't like this part of it, or for me, it has to be this. And then that there's that thing where you're shifting responsibility to the client uh, for their own actions and for their own follow through and for them doing their treatment. And uh, as you're learning more about them with this kind of questioning, they're starting to learn more about themselves. Yeah. And starting to think of their own intentions versus the, the probability of action and how to reconcile these two things within themselves. Yeah, that's great. So um, I want to ask a, 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 last, a last question, an off topic question, because uh, um, I know you wrote. Um, a, a new book about uh, Milton Erickson and William James, uh, a sort of a comparison between to, uh, these two genius. And yeah. um, is there something uh, studying Milton Erickson and studying uh, William James and comparing him? Is there something that you think that can be useful for who wants to know how to improve? Um, is scales about uh, how to build a relationship with, with clients. Yeah. I mean, imagine that you've grown up in a city all your life uh, and uh, you meet someone who's in the city trying to explain to you how to use farm skills and farm knowledge to interact with people and do therapy better, much as was Milton Erickson. Milton Erickson was uh, you know, constantly using things he learned from watching animals and, and relationships between people and animals or between animals, and then how these dynamics played out. Imagine that someone's trying to tell you that, and all you know is subways and bus schedules and skyscrapers, and you've never even seen a cow. Mm. And then imagine that while you're trying to understand that person, someone else takes you to a farm and walks you around the farm and introduces you to the cow and introduces you, you know, uh, it's that depth and level of understanding that you just could not get any other way. It's just impossible to have as good an understanding of what this means without going to the farm. And it's, when I, this analogy, it's not that William James himself is a farm, but <laughs> William James created the philosophical world that surrounded Erickson when he went to college. Uh, uh, you know, the psychology book at the time was The Principles of Psychology written by William James. And in it, uh, James laid out the foundation for this worldview 
that much of Erickson's uh, therapy and approach to people grew up out of. And so it's like, I guess it's almost like being able to go back to the family farm that Erickson grew up on and see that family farm. And then you're like, that's what these ideas mean. That's, you know, it's the same words you've always read. You've read them in, in several different books, but with this uh, other background, uh, you sh the, the, there's whole new dimensions that these I ideas start to take on. Hmm. Okay. So uh, then, uh... I would like to have a two hours interview with you talking about Ericsson and talking about relationships and strategies. But um, uh, thank you for, for your time. And uh, I hope to see you soon, maybe in person. Okay. And um, see you next time. Yes, it's a pleasure talking with you. A pleasure to me. Thanks. You bet.